Hi, everybody. It's Ken Burns. We're having another Unum conversation. I am so thrilled to say that we have with us today Margaret Rankel, who is a phenomenal columnist for The New York Times, who's just published this great book, The Comfort of Crows, A Backyard Year, which is, is just a wonderful reflection on nature. And I'm so pleased, Margaret, that you're able to join us. You know, I, my second film made in the early 80s was about the Shakers. And the Shakers found out that their poor neighbors were stealing their crops at night. So the Shakers planted more crops. They said, we plant some for the thieves and some for the crows and some for the Shakers. Thieves and crows have to eat too. And I just thought that part of their spirit, very Christian spirit of, of generosity, permeated the whole book that you have, have written in this wonderful sense of of how we are obligated to uh, relate uh, to nature. So um, it, it seems to me that it's shot through, and, and I get this, this um, sort of consideration of time, both cyclical and linear. The seasons change from one to the next, but we also change an age. And 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 you're sort of with both of the, those processes at the same time. I felt that the book was a meditation on time and how nature is itself a statement of impermanence. Um, your essay titled The Grief of Lost Time uh, begins driving due south in spring is like speeding up time. I once gave a commencement address where I just said I'd had the greatest privilege on earth is that I had seen five springs because I'd started in the South and worked my way North. And I thought that in some ways time had opened up, which nature also does. And I thought of my first experience in this of COVID in the spring of 20, I live in a rural area and it, it seemed like for the first time in my life, I was aware, not just day to day, but almost hour to hour of the progress of spring from the barrenness of those first terrifying weeks to the beginning of the hope of spring uh, throughout that. It was a marvelous gift. So can you talk to me a little bit about the very act of watching something nature so closely and how it changes your experience of time? Did time seem to move faster or slower for you in similar ways? Well, I, I should probably admit that this book isn't, it wasn't a new experience for me. I've worked well, I grew up a feral child and I've worked in a home from a home office for 27 years. So I'm a lifelong studier of nearby nature. And it is it was only just that I decided to write about it for this book. But I I do think a lot of people have that experience that you have. I know I remember in the spring of 2020 how how there was a shortage of bird seed and it wasn't because of the you know the famed interruption of distribution supply chain issues yeah it was really no. just that so many people who had been in offices of course not everybody had the right. the luxury of working from home during that time but the people who had been working in offices and who had come to think of screens as a respite from the responsibilities of the day. You know, they'd come home and turn on the television or come home and scroll through social media, or that's what they would do in their breaks. I think we got so sick of screens during that time and people began to stare out windows. And of course, in springtime, there's so much more to see. Um, or there was actually not more to see. There's just more sp splendor to see. And so it was like um, an ex a national experience of like of a pause that was unwelcome in many ways, but very welcome in that one, because you can't sit on your back steps with a cup of coffee and make a lot of noise and expect to see anything. There has to be stillness. There has to be quiet. You have to be patient. And those, those skills we've lost in the 21st century, we long lost them. So what the pandemic taught us was to recover ourselves as operating in natural time. You know, we had to be still. 
We had to be quiet if we wanted to see the birds, if we wanted to see the squirrels and the chimpanzees and the skunks and the possums and the raccoons, we had to be quiet. And I think for me, that's the gift, you know, that we shouldn't treasure our wild neighbors because of what they teach us. <laughs> we should tra treasure them for what they are. But what they teach us is that we're animals too, and that right. we feel happier and better when we're when we let time slow like that. The privilege of isolation, though, focused more intently the sense of wonder and that sense of opening up and the sense of quieting oneself to this process. And um, I just found your book just a kind of perfect complement to these meditations um, in, in a way. Thank you. It's, um, you know, I, I, I want to be careful. I don't want to sound like a scold. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say you should do this because we should all be doing this or otherwise we're going to lose some precious things. I want to say you should do this because you will feel better. You will, you will feel happier if you do this. And that is something that went, during the pandemic lockdowns, we had a derecho, a weather pattern come through Nashville. It was very unusual for middle Tennessee and the power was out for days and everybody kept walking around going, Oh my gosh, look at the stars, you know, because we just live in a light polluted city and it's easy to forget the stars. I think that this is it. And this is a perfect segue. I think you've just made to, you know, we made a film on the national parks and we explored the life and the writings of John Muir. He, he occupied his, his complicated and wonderful biography occupied the first two episodes of that multi-part series. And then his ghost in essence spoke to us uh, through to the end. Um, nature for Muir, as you know, really defined what it meant to be human. Uh, it's exactly what you're saying. Let's take a look at this clip. I think it's relevant to what you're exploring and perhaps in a, in a kind of different way. And now we'll just uh, play this clip uh, about John Muir from our National Parks film. John Muir once said, by going out into the natural world, I'm really going in. He defined in that sentence what it is to be a human being because I think we're born lost and we remain lost until we remove the shell of who we think we are, all the uh, preconceptions of who we think we are, and to expose ourselves to the, the great power of the natural world and to let that power reshape us the way it's reshaped the rocks of Yosemite Valley. Muir now felt he had discovered something else, his own destiny. The gaunt mountaineer with blazing blue eyes and long whiskers would devote himself to understanding the wilderness and then teach others the lessons he had learned. I, I think, you know, that by going out, you go in is the most wonderful paradox that you just described of, of when something interrupts a pandemic or a a power outage or whatever, we're suddenly faced with a new reality and, and we do look up and we do experience things differently. The, as Emily Dickinson called them, the far theatricals of day, our sunrises and sunsets often awaken in us something. They just startle us. They get us out of that self that's buried in the in the phone and or or consumed by the the thoughts of the day and, and take us someplace else. Um, he became an advocate for the land, but I think destiny in this case was more interior, a, a religious experience. Um, does that come from the deep observation of of nature? I mean, we we're talking earlier about it kind of opening up moments, but it's also a mirror of who we are and a very frank and honest. And I think a lot of people can't take the country because it's it's an unforgiving portrait that it sometimes reflects back at us. It tells us who we are. And I think people escape to their boxes and their shopping uh, in, in a city because of this great gift of nature. Not everybody, but, but many. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, of course, Muir was a special person. I mean, he was primed it seemed by genetics and by upbringing to be 
in search of holiness. And, um, and that is, there is a certain temperament that goes into a place like Yosemite or Yellowstone and sees holiness. But for a lot of people, I think those landscapes are so forbidding. It's what you're describing that we feel safer in our boxes. There's a sense that when you get out into big landscapes, there's a very real sense that we are not at the top of the food chain and that there are predators among us. There are grizzly bears, there are rattlesnakes, there are um, dangerous creatures. And and it is a feeling, we, we don't like that feeling. We're very, we find that feeling very unpleasant to know that we aren't in charge. And I don't really wish to be bitten by a rattlesnake, but I like the feeling of not being in charge. I find that very freeing. And I do experience that, those grand vistas as a kind of uh, conduit to holiness. But I wonder if we've made a little bit of a mistake in thinking of that as the only nature there is, you know, like that nature is this thing we get in a car and drive to, we pack special gear to experience. And of course, Muir was out there, you know, with nails in his shoes and not much else to, right. to help him. Sleeping on a glacier in order to get rid <laughs> right. of a, what he called a lowland virus, right? right. <laughs> the opposite it's, of what we do. It's very different from our experience. And, um, and I think it's it's it might be good for us to recognize that nature is not a destination. Oh. It's like last uh, Saturday morning, the sandhill cranes were gathering in the sky above my house in oh. Nashville. They they I don't know what happened to them, but they were a little disorganized, and they were kind of coming together and talking to one another in that wonderful burbling cry they have these are giant birds these are almost six foot tall birds and they're right right there you know they're not, right here they're, they don't live in my backyard like the squirrels do or the chipmunks do but they are right there if we're awake to them right. that's i think the key is awakening and i think muir knew that the spectacular was probably the biggest selling job but it's actually the quotidian and that's where i think you fit in so beautifully. We have Emerson, we have Thoreau, we have Muir. In the 20th century, we have Wallace Stegner, we have Terry Tempest Williams, we have you. And 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 what I thought in my first COVID spring was that I was each day watching. I finally understood how a leaf came out. It was I was always missing some of the parts, but now I was present for all of them. I love the way my woodpeckers, the pileated woodpeckers, have their wings sort of self, you know, set back in a way that's different from all the birds. I love the sort of high pitch sound of the red tail hawks, which I think is my favorite bird. I love the complaint, not only of the coyotes, but of the unseen family of bickering wild turkeys that are <laughs> constantly squabbling. And all of these other like tiny, tiny little gifts, you know, sometimes it's just a little orange um, baby salamander that is crossing the road and you help it get to the other side. Sometimes it's a big and threatening, gigantic um, snapping turtle, which you have to help with a stick get over. I'm <laughs> you trying to you help you. that one from way far away. I, I'm trying to save you, buddy or gal, <laughs> but please don't bite me, you know, and they'll take a two inch stick and cut it in half. I, I I love, I just love that part of it. The intimacy, the intimate parts of it, and not just, as you say, the spectacular scenery. Well, you know, it's funny, the, um, it, the thing that is miraculous to me is how, how much, even when you're watching, even when you're studying, even when you're really awake, you miss because every, Every you could you can't be there every minute of every day. And if I hadn't happened to be walking to the mailbox, I wouldn't have heard the cranes. You know, I'm so jealous, particularly of your southern 
uh, latitudes because up here we really feel a dearth of things. We there there's not as many amphibians as there used to be. There's not as many reptiles. I haven't seen a box turtle up here in the 45 years that I've lived here. And I used to catch them in Delaware growing up and in Michigan all the time. And insects too, not as many fireflies in the in the in the in the late June when they usually come and and just you know mesmerize you with their own constellations. Uh so I, I envy you your box turtle, I must but, say. But you know what, Ken, it's the same here. You know, that that box turtles, toads, um, lightning bugs, we call them here, yep. the, your fireflies, they're all diminishing visibly yeah. right before our eyes. And, and the warmth doesn't help. No, nope. no, it does not help. Um, you know, we just finished a film that aired in October on the American Buffalo. And part of the story is how for thousands of years, Native people, 10, 12,000 years, uh, lived with the buffalo, not as something removed from them, but as something related to them, as you were suggesting, that there's something actually disturbing about assuming our top of the food chain, which we are, uh, and then separating ourselves from nature and so that we've broken off this gift that Native people keep reminding us that we've broken off. We don't need to. These are our, our relatives. I'd like to just show this clip from near the very end of the film as you begin to think about how uh, Native people saw things and what part of the healing restoration process. We've saved the buffalo from extinction, but then there's other questions. Do we just want it you know, there as a zoo animal, or do we wish something more for this relative of ours? Let's, let's watch the clip. The most important work of restoring bison to their homelands is being done in concert with the people whose lives have been intertwined with the buffalo for more than 10,000 years. Back in 1991, representatives from 19 tribes gathered in the Black Hills to begin to form the Intertribal Buffalo Council and organize attempts to bring some of the bison from Yellowstone and other federal preserves back to their reservations. It was an act of healing that would reestablish a sacred connection with the buffalo that had been broken for more than a century. An elderly Lakota woman took one of the founders aside it's best you ask the buffalo if they want to come back, she said. So the group held a ceremony to do exactly that. They said they wanted to come back, the man remembered, but they said they didn't want to come back as cows. They wanted to be buffalo. They wanted to be wild again. Now, at least 80 tribes in 20 states control their own herds, grazing on nearly a million acres of tribal land. And on the Flathead Reservation, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes have taken over management of the National Bison Range. Bison are resilient, and they have taught us how to be resilient and adapt. They've survived, we've survived. They're here, we're here. We both persist. There's a lesson to be learned in that, in that we cannot, as human beings, afford to do that to our relatives, the animals. Those are our relatives. They are part of us. And when you look at a buffalo, you just don't see a big shaggy beast standing there. You see life, you see existence, you see hope you see prayer, and you see the future for your young, the future for those not yet born. You know, some people would say that looking at the buffalo roaming the great grasslands is different from watching crows on your back porch. Um, but I'd suggest, and I think you do, that perhaps this is the real thesis of your book, that we can find nature on the back porch in all of its glory. Is that true? How is it that we think we can deny the existence of nature when it is so close to home? I mean, we've been developing this theme. Can you develop it even more? It's impossible to watch a herd of buffalo in your film going across a giant grasslands and not 
feel awe. And awe is a, is a, it, it, it almost has to come from a sense of separation that we aren't that thing, that we are amazed and enraptured by that awesome thing. And it's harder, I think, to see that, that, that magnificent animal six feet at the shoulder, that magnificent animal as kin to us. And that is what the native people were able to do and never lost is that feeling of kinship. And of course it was an a fairer fight. You know, they weren't going out when they needed a buffalo. They were going to use every bit of that buffalo for one thing, but they they also risked their own lives in taking a buffalo, where which is very different from the 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 scenario you describe with the buffalo guns and the trains and and you know i think but i think that that feeling of kinship which we we struggle to feel is harder with the megafauna you know we aren't going to see our ourselves in a grizzly bear probably but we can if we're paying attention see ourselves in the backyard squirrels, we can see ourselves and the little pink fingered opossums. We can see ourselves. And when we can see ourselves in those creatures, it it, it is a, a, a kind of brotherhood, a kind of sisterhood, a kind of kinship that I think we kind of need yeah. to foster and develop in ourselves somehow, whether that's through uh, being reminded that our species hasn't always had that relationship of separation and superiority, that there are people among us who can teach us how to do that, but also um, just being quiet and listening. Because when you when you watch, you see that the skinks on the front stoop or the squirrels on the back deck or the possums sleeping under the tool shed, they have so many characteristics that we also have. And it's really obvious with crows. It's so wonderful. (laughs) Yes, with crows. I agree completely. This guy back here, my I'm watching him. Yeah. My polar bear on my iceberg is Chester. And he's he the other day or a few couple months ago just caught a possum. He ripped the leash out of my hand and ran in my backyard and caught a possum. And I'm screaming at him and chasing him. And I caught him. And the second I got there, he had it. And the possum played dead. It fell. And he was so shocked. He let go. And the possum took off. And I had always been told all my life and reading all the books and granddaddy stories from Virginia and the Blue Ridge Mountains, all this stuff, playing possum. And here was the exact example of it. And it was just, it was perfect. And Chester never got his his trophy. And I was so <laughs> relieved. Uh, but it's 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 really true. I think the thing, you know, after the wanton slaughter of the buffalo, in which we only want the hides to run the belts of the Industrial Revolution, the Native people have used, as you suggested, everything, not just for material sustenance, but for spiritual sustenance, and have that taken away, we understood somewhere deep in our consciousness the poverty of that, so that by 1913, we bring out an Indian head nickel that has on the front a Native American, we know who he was modeled after, and a, 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 um, a buffalo on the back, we know who it was modeled after, a, a buffalo from the Central Park Menagerie that then went to the uh, lower, the, the meatpacking district and was slaughtered and parted out for steaks. But the, the, the sculptor, a man named Fraser, said he wanted to design a coin that would be unmistakably the coin of our country. And what does he take to symbolize, to romanticize, I would suggest even fetishize, the mm-hmm. two things we have spent the last century trying to get rid of, Native peoples and, and Buffalo. And it seems like there was a, a, a kind of stab. George Horsecapture Jr., um, a Native American in the film after that just says, you know, I just have to ask you, why do you kill the things you love? And I think that what happens is that that superiority separates us and we are not able to look on these people as family members. And we, we've we done it. If you look at pretty much every subdivision in America is named for whatever 
the builder eradicated to put houses there. We have a mall here, Hundred Oaks Mall. There's not an oak tree in the zip code. And um, and it is a it's a question. And maybe it, it there's something deep in our psyche that um, that can't help. But I, I think that there's something deep in our psyche too that recognizes connection and belonging. Yes. Even even when we it surprises us. I think we feel that connection when we feel awe and we don't know, we don't know that that's what we're feeling. There's all we can say is this is beautiful. This is magnificent, but there has to be something in us calling us to that and saying, this is who you are. I I think it's a spark of conscience. It may be guilt. It may be an attempt at reconciliation. How come 90% of the high school, you know, mascots are Native Americans and territory that people relentlessly without a single thought from the East Coast to the West Coast were, were just didn't blink an eye at obliterating. And now they kind of get venerated in the same way that Nickel did. I think it somewhere is an expression of conscience. And you have a quote in your book um, uh, from the novelist Richard Powers from the Overstory, you cannot come back to something that is gone. You write about the American chestnut, which numbered in the billions, but has now disappeared. You know, um, the story is, of course, very similar uh, to the one we told in the Buffalo and also to the story of the beaver and also to the story uh, perhaps untold of the specific species of amphibians and reptiles and insects and birds that seem to be ever diminishing. Can you talk about that? You know, the, the, the that the whole first um, episode of the American Buffalo is very hard to watch because of that a, a wholesale slaughter and from so many different directions and for so many different reasons you know th you think about in the in one part of it all they're taking are the hides and then in another later part all they're taking are the heads and it's very disheartening to think that we are the species that does that yeah. that there is no other species that does that there's no other species that comes in and leaves nothing but you think about the passenger pigeons that were in flocks so large they darkened the sky as far as the eye could see and now there isn't even one not even one and so it can be thinking about history in that way thinking about our own role in it can be very demoralizing but then this is what i love about the american buffalo is that you describe all the all the constituents, sometimes seeming seemingly at absolutely cross purposes with one another, who came together to save that species and did, mm -hmm. and did. I mean, that's the thing that I keep, I take so much heart from, is that we aren't only the destructive yeah. species. We're also the healing species. We're also the cooperative species. We can do this yeah. and we can do this with the great extinction crisis that we're undergoing right now. We can do it with the climate crisis. I believe that we have proven again and again through history that we can do this. And all we have to do is look at the buffalo. Yeah, I think this is, this is really true. You know, we've part of the introduction to our second episode in which that motley assembly of human beings, some for reprehensible reasons of kind of right. nationalism and white <laughs> supremacy and eugenics are going to help right. save the buffalo um, and, and are happy to have earlier realized that the extinction of the buffalo helped them with the Indian problem. Right. We put in a quote by Wallace Stegner in which he said, you know, we are the most dangerous species on earth and every other species, including the earth itself, should have reason to fear us. But as you're suggesting, we're the only species when we set our mind to it that can save something. I think people say all the time, well, what can I do? What yeah. can one person do? What can anybody do? And then I think about George Bird Grinnell. You know, I think that there is, you know, you, John Muir. You think that there are individual people who galvanized. Rachel uh, Carson. Yes. Rachel Carson's a perfect example who galvanized us. 
you know, they weren't particular visionaries, really. They were people who were in love and and wanted to save what they loved. Your book, I think, comes off as kind of poetry, and yet it's really a manifesto. And it's in what you just said. It is, it, it's a call to action, but it has no kind of, it has, I guess, an inferred political dynamic or dimension, but it's really about an individual conversion that then aggregates individual actions in relationship to nature. And that's what I find so attractive about it. Is that your intention? Is it a manifesto in a way? It definitely. I mean, I, I want it to be a gentle manifesto. We don't have claws. We don't have fangs. We have very useless fur. We have achieved what we've achieved as a species by virtue of cooperation and intelligence and heart. And I think that we are still that species, but we can't, it won't happen. We can't just say this is going to happen because the scientists are going to figure this out for us, or there's going to be, um, the market forces are going to find a way to make it more profitable to do the right thing than to do the wrong thing. I think all of those things will probably happen, um, must happen to to save to for to save ourselves and to save the the world we love. But I also think it's very empowering to be an, one person who makes a tiny little difference, plants a pot of milkweed on a city balcony or stops spraying poison on a yard or digs up the grass on the median between the sidewalk and the street and puts in zinnias, just a little 69 cent pack of zinnia seeds from the grocery store. And when you see those butterflies coming, when you see the bees, when you see the fireflies rising up from the fallen leaves that you let lie in your flower beds and ideally even in your yard, you feel better you feel you are empowered to try harder to do more. And if we all did that as a collective, we could change the entire conversation and stop letting it be so political. It isn't political. Just like that that coalition of people who came together to save the buffalo. This is not your side versus my side. This is our side. It's the human side. You have these wonderful between chapter interstitials, don't know any other way uh, to put it, that ask us to pause and think differently about some aspect, some moment uh, in the world. And as we're entering the summer section of your book, you have a praise song for the red fox screaming in the driveway. <laughs> Can you talk about that? Well, if you've never heard a red fox scream, you you would you would feel absolutely certain that a woman was being murdered in the woods. It is the the most blood curdling sound you'll hear. In this particular case, there's a little bit of woods behind a neighbor's house <clears throat> down at the end of my street. And the fox was sitting in the drive and the fox there, there was, there's a red fox den behind their house. It's been there for years and years. And, um, and th this is a sweet, 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 sweet neighbor who keeps chickens in her backyard, but she doesn't try to evict the foxes. She just shores up the chicken house. But the fox was really mad at a cat and was sitting in the driveway screaming its head off because the cat was getting a little too near the den. And broad daylight, it's not something that you expect to see, but there it was right there among us. So you know, nature is pretty unforgiving and you can see some stuff, you know, the, the, my, my red tail hawk is sometimes catching a snake or sometimes carrying away a, a, a field mouse or something like this. Uh, you see what we do to it. Uh, is this a pod when you see that, I mean, do you see the thrillingness of watching the predators or do you see it a heartbreaking to know what we're doing or do you feel sort of galvanized in an evangelical way to speak about it. And, I, and then I'd like to go a little bit farther and ask you, you've talked about zinnias in the medium strip. You've talked about planting, you know, something in your balcony of your apartment building. 
what else can people do? I think people are looking for agency of some kind in relationship to this crisis, as you've described, and we feel powerless that we're just going to let it see what science can do, see what politics can do, see what, you know, uh, the marketplace can do. But it, it it's not going to entirely be that. It's going to be about individual action. I remember everybody, everybody in the late 60s, my entire life, when you went out, say, to a McDonald's, you threw things out the window. Out the window. Every, out the window. And literally from one moment to the next, it, you know, when Earth Day happened, it just more or less stopped, at least among people that aren't knuckleheads. Right. And, and it's, it was an amazing and instantaneous transformation. It happened in New York City when, you know, you just walking in New York City was like trying to avoid stepping in dog poop. And then they pass all and everybody does it. I mean, now you see it and you go, oh, my God, what kind of human being let that go? You yeah. know, <laughs> just right. from one moment to the next, it doesn't seem like we, we always think this is a, some sort of Sisyphean task. But I, I think our experience, the turnaround with the buffalo, too, we woke up and said, oh, no, there were 70 million, maybe. Now there's 531 and most of them are in zoos or in private collections. And we're going to, we stop on a dime and completely change direction without too much whiplash and so many other things we've, we've done in our lives. Can you talk about the furthering of this manifesto? The, what, what is it that all of us can be doing to help make this home a better home? Well, beyond just recognizing that we do share this ecosystem with neighbors, wild neighbors, they are here among us, whether we see them or not, and and work really hard at learning to think of them as neighbors and not as inconveniences or nuisances. Shore up the kitchen, the chicken coop instead of evicting the foxes. I think first recognizing that they're here, that they're among us, that this is theirs too, and trying to be a good neighbor to them in the same way that you would try to be a good neighbor to the people who live around you and not be playing your music too loud, not be blocking their driveway with your with your car. I mean, there are just certain things that that you would never think about doing with another person that you that we have we we have become accustomed to giving no thought to when it comes to the the other creatures we share the planet with. So I think um, a lot of, and I do want to be, I, I want to be careful to say that I don't, I, I, I really do believe in political, in the politi yes. collective political will and the engineering minds and the market as a, a method for moving things very quickly. We, we've already seen that, that it's cheaper to produce renewable energy now than it is to dig another uh, to start another coal-fired power plant. We know that. But, and and it would be a mistake, um, and it would be a mistake that the oil companies would love us to make, to believe that this is all on us, that how we do manage our private lives, our personal carbon footprints is all it's going to take. And that would be a mistake to believe. But within the context of trying to be a good neighbor, there are a lot of things all through this book that I, I put in there, not as prescriptions, but just as little descriptions. When you don't kill the moles in your yard, when you let the moles live underground, bothering nobody, and um, they're eating the grubs that eat the roots of your trees, but they're also pushing up loose soil that makes for a perfect landing space spot for wildflower seeds when they come through on the wind or when they come through in bird droppings or on the coats of mammals and letting those early, early wildflowers just have your yard in spring. That's food for the bees when they first emerge from their underground burrows and start building and start building their their lives. It's really just a matter of doing no harm as a first step. And then I think it's also a matter of trying it as much as possible to change the fashion. What's, what's in style is not healthy for us. The green carpet of grass is not healthy for us. It's not healthy for our wild neighbors. 
Um, the chemicals aren't healthy for us. The grass itself is feeding nobody. There are things like that when we just retune our way of seeing and we see the, the tangled wildflowers as beautiful and not the grass. Let me go back to end on this idea of time, because I think as we began, we saw time as a moment being opened up in an appreciation of nature, a kind of stopping of it or or, or a new way of seeing it, a new dimension. Marsha Pablo, who is a Native American in our film at the very end said, Native peoples plan seven generations out. I learned that in our when we were working on our Roosevelt series, that FDR planted one billion trees. And this means that somebody somewhere has um, a conception of time that isn't completely imprisoned by, say, the marketplace, which says, judge me quarter to quarter. What's my, what's the performance that I've delivered to my shareholders? Even the most successful businesses don't do that way because that's how we lost the manufacture of so many things in this country because we were looking for just shareholder value. So I think to me that time has both a kind of um, atomic, microscopic relationship to this story that you're telling, but it also has this magnificent macro view, just as the architecture of the atom is very similar to the architecture of the solar system, that we've got to sort of integrate both these kinds of long form and also the intimate moment uh, together if we're going to save the planet and, of course, um, ourselves. And it begins, as you suggest, not by changing your environment, but by actually looking at it. It's always right there, whether you live in the city and all of a sudden everybody's a buzz because there's a peregrine falcon that's nesting on Fifth Avenue and for months we're wondering where that is, or there's a coyote in Central Park or whatever it might be, we've got a connection and the connection can begin now. We don't have to wait for certain circumstances to occur for this work to begin. I think that's really true. And we, it's the quarter to quarter thing that, that is so dangerous and so damaging. It's also individual ownership. You know, when you think of a tree as yours, because <clears throat> it's growing on a piece of property that you say you own because you're paying the bank for it, then you can cut that tree down without any kind of, it, it's like, no different from moving your your furniture around, but that isn't what it is. So we have to, I think, fundamentally shift our understanding of the natural world to that stretch of time. We don't own that tree. We borrowed that tree from the past and we owe it to the future. And and if if you you, you know the seven generations, that's a start. That's a really good start, but as you know from your work, there are trees. We like to put it in perspective of human time. We say, oh, that tree was a sapling when Jesus walked the earth. And in fact, that's not an unimaginably long time ago when Jesus walked the earth. It's a very it's a blink in geologic time. So we I think if we start looking at time from that perspective, be the the, the time that came before us and the time that is coming after us. Um, even if it is just seven generations, <clears throat> excuse me, I think we'll be doing, that's a magnificent start. Yes. Um, Margaret, we are so grateful that you gave us some time today. Margaret's book is The Comfort of Crows. It's such a wonderful book in every single way. We're so thrilled that you could spend, it's oh, a, a, back, a backyard year, I should, should have said. And it's got wonderful uh, illustrations in it. And I just heartily recommend it. I think it will um, repay uh, your attention over and over again. Thank you, Margaret, for spending time with us. Thank you for having me, Ken. It's just been wonderful to talk with you. My pleasure.